You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast, and I am very pleased to have Shara Nova, a uh, singer and uh, also within the musical uh, ensemble, <laughs> My Brightest Diamond. Uh, Shara, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Ken. Yeah, I haven't told you this yet, but you're one of the guests. I've done the show for a little over three years. You're one of the guests that uh, I've always wanted on when I, you know, first started my first episode in this head of mine. So I just want to really thank you for coming on and spending some uh, spending some time on the show and talking some philosophy and art. So amazing! Yeah, it's exciting. Um, That's so cool. Yeah, I'm not sure when you're walking around, uh, you were recently in Chicago and you're walking around, people walking up to you say, hey, Shara, I was wondering what is art and <laughs> and all these type of things. But uh, I uh, shared my love of Chicago to you recently there uh, performing, and I thought it'd be a nice thing to talk about just Chicago and your recent experience there and uh, what you're up to uh, artistically now. Yes, it's a shift coming out of pandemic and being so isolated for so long. So um, I was invited to play a concert in Detroit uh, on December 3rd called, uh, for a, a citywide event called Noel Night. And then that was quickly followed by seven shows opening for Andrew Bird in the First Presbyterian Church in Chicago. And both of those concerts were in these really big churches. And each of those environments were really different acoustically. So I had to plan and accommodate for the situations, which were which were quite different. And to be honest, Ken, I have really been in the composer seat writing for choir, and I made a film with my friend Helga Davis during the pandemic. I wrote an opera, I wrote a choral song cycle for the choir, The Crossing, and I had written only one song for myself in three years because that's the way, that's how life had me. Yeah. Um, and so what I did was I wrote 14 new songs in a month really thinking about these church spaces and what these concerts were. So I just got home two days ago. So I'm still <laughs> like in the rest and it's recovery. Like, it's like, Ken, hey, uh, let's, let's, let's reflect in 2023. It's a little <laughs> raw. But, um, well, I want to jump on that point. You're saying 14 in a month. I, I, you know, I don't know you. We're just chatting right now. But I, I look at the work that you do, the, the intensity, the thinking. I know you must put into it and in, in composing. 14 songs in a month, Shara? Like, what, what, was, what, was that, what was that concentrated experience like? Sometimes I feel like Olympic athletes are my greatest inspiration mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, of the amount of focus, the amount of discipline, and the rigor that's required but I also think that there's something about creating these ridiculous goals for oneself and, and setting this high bar for yourself that no one told me I had to write 14 new songs, but it was really my own impulse of trying to get that channel to the ether open and using this as a provocation of kind of a certain kind to in a sense force me to have that kind of rigor and discipline yeah well it's uh well i mean as a as a fan you know on this side of the ledger uh we we get to we get to benefit from that, but uh, yeah, it was just really. I I, I know uh, I found it fascinating how you referred to you know like athletes, Olympic athletes, because I, I just thought of it in the terms of my head on this show. I've had athletes on uh, and female athletes and first and um, you know kind of like um, 
in advocacy, uh, African American female pro hockey player and getting into sport and stuff like that. And there's an intensity that's been in the back of my head around that too. But I hadn't thought about that, the convergence until you said what you said. I was surprised when I heard it, but it made instant sense of in Olympic training, the athlete pushing through peak performance. Now's the time. Let's do it. Um, wow. <laughs> And, and creating that willpower for yourself, there's no one, there's kind of not an external motivator. You're really working with your own willpower. And that's, that's I think, um, why I look to athletes so often. And you're also, you're, you're working with your own body. You're working with your own limitations yeah. And there's a certain isolation that I think athletes also experience that I certainly feel as a musician living a lifestyle that is quite irregular. And so having to um, restrict oneself from from what maybe the neighbors are doing or what what your yeah. peers are doing in in the community and to say, I can't do that. I'd really love to do that, but I have to, you know, I have to do this other thing called music. Do you, do you find that a regular piece of it? I talk to artists and my, my find, you know, my schedule is tough to explain to others and artists have that uh, go on. Do, do, do you feel you've dealt, dealt with that, you know, better over time, the irregular, the, Oh, it's coming in now and it's a strange time and it's, that's the time in Japan or whatever, you know, that's, that's strange about artistry or, you know, related fields. Um, have you gotten more used to that or more comfortable with that? I never get used to losing friends. Yeah. And unfortunately that has happened over time where I think I might be able to be present with someone for a period of time, but then the, nature of writing an opera or the nature of writing a record and going on tour for months at a time means that I'm, I need friendships that can sustain over very long periods of time, more like, um, seasonal friendships rather than the kind of like more consistent ones. And so the people that have been able to endure are ones that, that, have an understanding or have an expectation of me that that I'm not constantly disappointing them. And that's that's been tough. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah. But yeah. For those who have been able to stay, you know, or have been able to kind of manage their own expectations of what I can be as a friend, um, those friendships are incredible. And I am so grateful for for those people in my life. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenging, you know, idea that that you put up front as far as what it brings to to relationships. But that mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. I I think ultimately it's really tough to get used to. Like, and sometimes people experience on a, just a direct level, you know, like working third shift. I remember when I worked third shift, it was like, hey, two hour nap and let me join the other world that seems to still exist. That's at a different time and wants me over here. So uh, definitely get that. Hey, um, I wanted to, uh, in, in here now, I, I have to ask a conceptual question because I, I uh, really want to uh, get into that. And I know we could probably talk for a long time, but like I want to jump into it. I get uh, uh, before the conceptual question, this might be strange to say, before the conceptual question, I want to make sure I ask one, one question of you. Um, I've seen you live, and when I've seen you live at times, um, uh, your, your, your voice impacts me and, uh, it's a physical reaction, the goosebumps to hearing songs. People are very sensitive to music can describe that experience. And other folks would be like, I don't get goosebumps when I hear somebody sing. I've had that experience a, a lot with you. And here's the blunt and I maybe unfair question. Like, how does that happen? Like, what is, what do you think like on an artistic level? Um, and have you experienced that, uh, 
sometimes when I'm trying to describe that to others who are love music but don't aren't physiologically impacted, they don't know what I'm talking about. I think there um I experience that as well where I have really really physical reactions to music and it's immediate and if it's if it's not happening for me then it's not happening for me um it is such a mystery and I also become very curious around songs that make those goosebumps happen at the same exact time every time I listen to it. Because then I'm like, there's something in the physics that's happening yeah. right now that is causing this. Like, what is the math here? Yeah. So there's both, like, I think a math component, there is a whatever's happening in the moment in a room, like, you might have the same exact performer doing the same thing. And if a side door opens and the light shines at the wrong time or the bartender smashes the glass, you might not get the chills. So there's something so elusive about manufacturing that thing. I don't think that it can be manufactured. Yeah. Yeah. What I, as a performer expect of myself is that I am never going through the motions that I am committed even in sound check. So uh, when I sing songs, I try to never practice unaliveness. I try to not to say that I have to kind of always be wearing my heart on my sleeve, but that, that a certain, that I don't even allow the body to learn how to physically play a note or to sing a note in a way that isn't fully connected Mm. to the breath or, you know, of course you're tired on days and of course you've sung a song a hundred times, but I, I, I've always been inspired by improvisers and by instrumentalists, by violinists who, who never allow themselves to play the violin out of tune. They are always m- making sure that they're playing that pitch in tune. And again, it's, it's not something you can always demand of yourself, but I think <laughs> if you really try to be present, and practice presence, hopefully that translates to goosebumps for somebody. Yeah. And uh, it's either in the magic, the math, or the physics, probably, at the end of yeah. the day. Or all, <laughs> or all all three, I started thinking about the physics. Uh, you know, your mind ranges is like, can I get an answer in this direction? Or can I get an answer in this direction? I get that. Um, to, the, to the conceptual, the big question that I know you've thought about, once or twice, you're an artist, you put all that effort of trying to do it that way each time. But what is, what is art? What do you think art is, Shara? Pause. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. It's a hundred percent. It's hundred percent. And there's a chuckle rather when I ask something rather than nothing and a little bit of a No, there's a chuckle there. There's a pause. Yes. (laughs) It is an infinite question, and infinite questions are wonderful to to sit with for, for a lifetime. And I think I started asking that question very young, particularly around what what beauty was and whether or not the pursuit of beauty was worthy of one's life. And I remember asking that question at 20 years old to my voice teacher. And I asked her, what is the value in the tenor's high note? And she said, I don't think that's your question. I think what you really want to know is what is the value of your high note? 
And so when she spun that around to make it personal and to and to demonstrate my own vulnerability, yeah, that I feared that what I had to share or what I had to express was not worthy of being heard. I still am trying to affirm myself in that. Art to me is a way of processing my life. It's a way of coming to meaning making, the meaning making of my experiences I translate into song. It's a way of marking the day, marking the sunset, marking the moon. It's a way of marking birth and death. It's a way of, and I say a way because I suppose for me, music is a process. It's not an object. So if we were speaking about art as objects, um, I probably would answer differently. But the role that I see myself in society as a musician is to is to be both an articulator of my own personal experience, but also to encourage people to try and bring, as you say, something from nothing to bring, um, to bring my own fear and transform that into bravery or to bring my own feelings of resentment and transform that into something that is a recognition that I am just like everybody else or so there's this transmutation or this yeah. desire for churning what is hard about life and trying to name significance of something or to, to make meaning or to I'm hesitant to say to be light, to encourage <laughs> people, because that's how you know that I'm a minister's daughter. And yeah. I think yeah. that art always has to have a purpose or the kind of edict that I grew up with that art needs to be smiley, keep, 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 uh, keep a smile on, you know, make the people feel good. Yeah. And and so I've wrestled with that. Yeah, and you've talked about it in terms of a process. And once you said that, I was hearing like, you know, the verbs of how you're talking about it in two very different ways. And I and I, I think, you know, having that that active piece in or like what it is that you're trying to do with the art is is that activity I find in music, I don't know if there's a clumsy kind of way of describing. I find in music is like, you know, like the uh, album or the recorded thing when you deal with musicians is like that snapshot. It's the capturing at that moment at this time of what's going on. But when you're around musicians, it's like, when do you take the snapshot? How do you record the snap? It's like when you're, when you're just looking at somebody. And um, I think, um, I, I really like the active verbs and how you describe it and seeing it as, you know, and I think it is a different thing with the object, right? Because I could say, I could say to you, the object is yes, you're singing, but once every few months I get goosebumps and I'm at a live performance or I'm at your performance. And that's like the thing is, 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 is right. Then the object is I can convey to you 11, 12 years ago, seeing you live and having that experience, because I remember that one over the 1 million others where it didn't happen. So um, 
do you think the role of art has 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 changed um you know uh, my backdrop for this is you know humans always expect cataclysm there's always some sort of thing that people are reacting to with art but nowadays I, you know recent times the uh, pandemic uh political volatility in certain aspects um climate crisis i asked the question if there's something qualitatively different about these times that the role of art or the importance of art has changed that it's more important now or do you think it you see it tied to art just doing what it always does um, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's such a, such a good question. When I get overwhelmed about the algorithm, I go back to the bard, the role of the bard. And a book that really helped me was Daniel Levitin's The World in Six Songs, where he talks about this kind of six themes of the way that music has functioned in society. So certainly the way that we listen to music has changed really significantly. And because I'm old enough to have been pre-streaming, yeah. the difference between my first record coming out in 2005 and the way that people listen now is very, very different. Yeah, Music is never going to lose its importance to human beings. That I'm not in doubt of. <laughs> but how it is that we, we see music's purpose in our world is is shifting and my interest in being a detroiter in particular is to continue to have a relationship to my local community when someone asks me to sing at a wedding or a funeral or invites me to the hospital for a birth i want to be able to be a musician in that moment too yeah and so I take my role as a musician in community really pretty seriously. It's something I talk about cultural leadership, that this desire to become famous or this desire to become a, have a hit or to have a viral video, whatever, that's great. That's like winning the lottery. If that yeah. happens to you, cool. But what does it mean to cultivate an environment that fosters creativity in your local community. That to me is a much more sustainable idea than everyone let's chase for our 15 seconds of fame in that Andy Warhol, <laughs> with that Andy yeah. Warhol reference. Yeah. To me, that is not what I'm going after. I'm going after something else. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, the, the, the consumption of music is, is something I've been thinking about too. Cause this is, this is pretty cool. My, uh, my son who's 14, at least out here, there's a little, there's a bit of resurgence. We're seeing this, the tangible media, it's still underground, but it's growing kind of like, uh, that there's a market for CDs now, at least where I am, that there's a market for VHS and, you know, speculation around the tangible piece, right? The reaction versus the digital. I want the thing. I want the hard plastic VHS cassette or I want the disc. But um, even on listening, because um, I was surprised to have my son listen to a CD, talk about the album listen through the album by cd and i have a bunch of cds i'm like these where are they gonna go you know five years ago in my head like i have them but uh, it's youtube and streaming i want to listen to this now all around us but um so the cds are back out and i think about things like you know vinyl and cds of listening to the album because that's how you consume and uh, I just wonder with, with with if there's any shift back to the tangible physical media, people become more dedicated to the whole uh, than than they I have. Guess it's about experiences. 
So if you want the experience of having to turn a vinyl record over halfway through and get up and do it, (laughs) there's something about the experience of that. And I think for me as a performer, what I console myself with (laughs) maybe, (laughs) but also what I challenge myself with is how can I be offering people experiences of music rather than just here's something to listen to on Spotify. That's not an, that's not a unique experience. Whereas if I can create, if I can think through an environment that is going to challenge you in some way, or is going to comfort you in some way, or is going to serve a purpose for example, I've done things in outdoor parks. I wrote a piece called Look Around for 600 Musicians with the Cincinnati Symphony in 2019. And there was 20 different community groups that were a part of that as well with marching bands and dancers. And and then I've done things like four screen surround sound films where you're in an enclosed environment that's very private. It's all dark. It's very personal. It's not exposed. Of course, done rock shows in those different those different things too. When I'm writing for choir, I've often thought about working in different in in multi, multiple dimensions so that you're surrounded more like these pop-ups. So those kinds of different environments are really fascinating to me because that's not something you can get in headphones. When you're in headphones or when you're driving in your car with a CD player, you are having a personal experience and you may be more inclined to cry then or to sing at the top of your lungs without caring who's going to hear you. Yeah. So all of those different ways that we experience music really, really fascinate me. And they motivate me to write different kinds of material for, for each of those different situations. Yeah. One of the things I I notice about, um, you know, what you do and, uh, it, it, I, I become fascinated because I think sometimes uh, in talking to artists, they experience themselves of, uh, you know, varied, varied interests or different ways of expressing themselves. And the, just the inertia of society and industry and marketing, how that just exists. And, um, I, I, I really want to ask this because, um, I think artists encounter this when you're working in, they're not, uh, not disparate areas, but ways of expressing yourself in, in the environments or, or, or recording an album or your, it's you share a, it's my brightest diamond. Um, how do you, how do you, are you comfortable in knowing what you're doing, you know, for yourself and having that bravery in saying, this is how I'm going to do my performance here. And, and this is how I want to do it here. Is that something over time where you're like, this is what I want to do. I feel it. And I go towards it. Is that how it works? Pause to think. <laughs> <laughs> you're the type of guess. I'm not going to send all my questions to, because I know I'm going to throw you the big ones and you're still going to take the twigs out, <laughs> even with the pause, even with the pause. So those different situations, I suppose I have had a bit of a unique musical life in that way that the concert hall or the club or the park or the festival, those are all different situations that um, have different physical acoustics. And so in each of those situations, I am really having to consider the space and the trajectory of my career has really been trial and error. In the beginning, the first two records were, let me take these classical instruments, put them together with my band, see what happens, you know, try to see how far I can push pop songwriting in one direction or another. 
But then by the third album, having been so frustrated with playing in clubs and having the violins feed back in the monitors and the drummer being asked to play quieter and my guitar tone having to get thin because it, I had to play quiet. Those kinds of frustrations then brought me to say, okay, third record, only acoustic. Then the fourth record, I was like, I'm tired of playing quiet in these concert balls. <laughs> I want to play, play loud and outside. So then I wrote for marching band because that was the loudest thing I could think, you know. Yeah. And then... After that, I was kind of frustrated. There's a lot of frustration is the theme going yeah. here. <laughs> um, then after the marching band kind of synthesizer record, then I thought, okay, let me just work with crowd vocals and what could I do that would be, believe be believable coming out of a computer. So the fourth record, there's really only four elements to any of the songs. I tried to keep it to four so that I could tour with tracks and me with a drummer. And now I find that I don't have songs that can work solo. So when you ask where does where do the songs come from, they come from these different situations where I don't have the right song or I don't like the way I have to play that song solo because I envisioned it with drums. So maybe I want to write a new song. Yeah. And it's, it kind of propels, I mean, yes. propel, pro propels you to the next uh, solution. Uh, we're speaking with Shara Nova and uh, Shara, we're going to uh, cut to uh, cut to a song, a, a little intermission of your song, uh, uh, Champagne, a couple words about this uh, uh, fantastic track. And I love your uh, I'll say right now, I love you um, dropping down in the way you describe dropping down into, into the beats and into the sound. I listened, I grew up listening to a lot of the sounds you refer to a uh, Motown. My parents were always into some, uh, some funk. And um, so uh, champagne, champagne, tell us about champagne and we'll cut to it. Yeah. Champagne is a good reference for this kind of minimalism that I was just referring to where there's this crowd sing along and a synthesizer as the foundation. And then the guitar makes an appearance and drums. And it's really very simple in that way. This was mixed by Andrew Sheps. And I think he did a killer job. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, champagne, my brightest diamond. Stop what's coming up I cannot go halfway No, I will not stop Going up Going up Jealousy tight, I never spoke it out right I've been blaming you for putting me down, pulling me down But I know how to float in gravity In the end that blames on me You said, I said, you said, all right. Did you want to see me cry? Hey, nice try. Yeah, I shook inside like a kid. 
Champagne, Shara. You like dance clubs? Sometimes. Sometimes, right? <laughs> matters. Matters. Matters <laughs> which. Matters which one, Ken? <laughs> yeah. It depends on what mood I'm in. I mean, I can very happily find the sunrise. If, yeah. If the, if the environment is right, I'll dance till dawn. But, is it outside um, or is it inside usually? That's a good question. I've I've done both. Yep. Yep. It's been it's been quite a few years now though with this uh this yeah. last year um I did some being from Detroit. We have Movement Festival in May and they had some amazing DJs outside and that was that was so fun oh. and and felt a lot safer. So still yeah. finding finding my way we're all finding our way with uh these infections society how to do yeah. things again i uh yeah i'm thinking something rather than nothing festival someday i try to organize and create art and generate art and inspire art with doing this and i never expected like that'd be kind of an outcropping or what i'm doing uh what I'm, what I'm doing with this, but, um, uh, I, you know, I enjoyed like the idea of a festival and sharing arts. I haven't really been like as a, as a person, as an artist, I've identified as an artist just the last few years by putting time into it and seeing myself, uh, as one. So it's been a fun, uh, time for me to generate ideas. One thing I wanted to ask you, I'm forgetting the name of, um, the small book you put together, but I know you, there was artistic, like, affirmations i love them and i i read one i was like oh my gosh and i know those are like you're selling those in a limited fashion can you just tell me a little bit about that project because that's like that's where a lot of i've got a lot of my guidance in art from a kind of like process and inspiration so tell us about that yes i i created a little book uh called provocations on creativity provocations. that is not for just musicians, but I was thinking about creativity as a human right and as part of the human human experience and that it should not be relegated to the professional, that we as human beings are creative constantly and that creativity is like a muscle that's grown. And I run so often into people that were told as children that they couldn't sing or that they couldn't this, they couldn't that, they couldn't this, they weren't good. I'm not good at drawing. Even I myself am really judgmental of my drawing. And I have to yeah. tell myself over and over again, like, it is okay to be a child. It is okay to develop a vocabulary with sentences, with learning your letters and with making words and making sentences that is your pencil on paper or is the growth of my watercolor or whatever, whatever the form is. And so I have been writing on Substack 
and sharing some behind the scenes because I found that Instagram or these very short form media is not allowing me to share what I've learned from 30 years of songwriting. And I am getting to that place where I want to offer the things that I've learned to people. And Substack feels like a way for me to to write about my life, to share about these lessons that I've learned. And so the provocations booklet was something that that I made that was just just kind of uh, whimsical, but also really thinking about building these kind of foundational blocks to support people in their creative journey. Yeah. And I've just had, uh, and, and I appreciate that too. And I think it's so important that, that you do that because like I said, um, whenever I have not, uh, not been trained in something that I do, I engage in teaching myself. Right. And, but that has to do with like resources of like just basic fundamentals. How do you, when you wake up, what practice should you do to set yourself up for, you know, exercise in those muscles. And I know um, the big thing I deal with personally is the being pulled to, um, because of the, you know, demands of work and other type of things where I'm pulled to this very tiny, you know, machine, computing machine phone into that rather than the, the process where I've had people helping me of like a morning page in the morning. And why don't you just sketch for 20 mm. minutes? And Because I really think, and I'm trying to improve on this myself. I really truly believe it narrows the horizons of your day so much, at least for me with what I enter into at the beginning of the day and how it anticipates what's going to happen further. And I think I, I think we limit ourselves. And I think when you write, what you've written and it's like a uh, affirmation or something to jar you or something to say, Hey, this is how you make art follow steps one, two, and three. Amen. Because <laughs> that's the guide. It's not, it's not me checking my messages on my phone. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate that book. Um, so Shara, um, Two more things to do. One is the big question of the show. Another is make sure everybody finds all the art and all the some things that you do. But the question is to Sharon Nova is why is there something rather than nothing? It's a big question about the universe, whether or not we are reflecting itself back to itself, whether we are expanding. And and these are unknowable questions, but for me, this idea of being an active participant in creation, it is, it is always something that fills me with awe that I can begin the day without a song and in a few hours something comes from nothing. So how is it that I'm able to sculpt vibration? (laughs) And some of those songs are done by chisel, meticulous, painful, and others of them literally appear in minutes. Mm -hmm. Those are rarer. Yeah. When those come, though, it is it is so thrilling because I don't feel that I wrote them. And all the other times that I'm chiseling and I'm working the craft and I'm gaining skills and I'm hammering away, trying to get a melody out or trying to get a chord progression or trying to get something. Um, I don't love those songs less. But I, I do think that that craft building makes me more available, I hope, or I sense, to be ready to receive that radio frequency, to get the something from the nothing. 
Do I feel like I'm getting help? I do. Can I say who it's from? No, I can't. Yeah. I cannot explain the fact that when those songs come down, like a direct download, it's, it is just <laughs> awe inspiring to me. Yeah. 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 I, and uh... then someone would say, Oh, you wrote that song. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't write that one. <laughs> <laughs> they gave that to me whoever yeah. they is yeah yeah but but it had to come through me it had to come through my life experience so it's not that i'm not there when it happens either it's coming through my life it's coming through all the things that have made me up until that very moment so it's not that i'm just like uh an empty hose or something. Yeah. I think one of the, and, and, and thinking about that, I think, um, about experience of when I was painting and I made oh, just a, an absolute mistake in my head, but it ended up being the painting that like, I was like, after that, I said, I'm a painter. Cause like, this is like, I, I, I'm floating into what, what this is. And it was a depiction in, in my head of like a Western Wisconsin farm. It's not, a, it's just an, an atmosphere. But once I made that mistake and once that occurred, and once I stepped back, I had been transformed and being like, Oh, that's what they're talking about. And you could probably talk about it in one of your provocations. It'd be like that beautiful mistake you made. <laughs> that screw up is, is you with your, you know, masterpiece or the thing you're most proud of, you know? So that's some mystery in that as well, right? Uh, with our I've had to get lectured. I have to say, I have some friends that have had to kind of, I don't want to say sit me down, but there's a kind of over perfecting or over uh, nitpicking in the work that can happen. And I have, in essence, overly uh edited material and i'm referring to your pencil line or to the to your mistake in the painting and a friend of mine said to me shara i got to see my favorite painting live and i couldn't believe when i got up close to it there were all of these quote unquote imperfections in the work but when you see it from far away it doesn't read in that way so finding those relationships where someone can buffer your tendency to want to over tweak or, oh no, yeah. let me hide that pencil line or let me try to make this clean or, you know, I use relationships that I trust, like people that are in my life that can really say, hey, yeah. <laughs> you've, you've lost perspective here. It's yeah. time to stop. And that's so important within the within the community to cultivate too, to be able to receive that that feedback. And yeah, yeah, mistake mistakes and overthink. I mean, I it, in 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 battling through those too, because I know when I get caught in a rut, say painting, because I'm, I guess I would reasonably say I'm most neurotic in my relationship with like how I paint, but um, just in the sense where you can get caught up in a rut and saying you can already visualize the mistakes you're going to make because you've done that before. And then, you know, folks saying, Hey, um, next day you're painting with your left hand. If you're right dominant and there you go, there you go. Your brain's going to rewire something. I don't know what it's going to rewire, but it's going to trip something up. And that's what you need right now, friend. So, <laughs> um, you know what this, this that's reminding me of is Agnes Martin. She's one of my very favorite painters. And, I watched a documentary on her during the pandemic. For some reason, I was obsessed with learning about women painters. There was a Artemisia Gentilici, I think is how you say her last name. Okay. Um, she was an Italian, I think an Italian painter, and they had an exhibition of her at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. And then I had never really been a Georgia O'Keeffe fan, but I stumbled upon her 
and went through her biography and just wanted to understand how did she think. And also there's an Agnes Martin documentary online. And I was so profoundly moved by Agnes drawing her very measured straight lines and saying that she wanted to be without belief, that her spirituality wasn't based on belief in something. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a very profound statement because in the West, and certainly me growing up a Pentecostal, in a Pentecostal church family, belief is so foundational in Pentecostalism, in evangelicalism, everything is about the belief, not around the practices of the faith. And I was always fascinated by liturgy or, or people that were in practices like yoga that were not based on what you believed, but on these actions or yeah. in in the liturgy, the actions of communion or the actions of kneeling. Of course, that's a very gross generalization, but I think part of what has made me so hesitant to talk about spirituality in public and really in my work, and only now am I very beginning, like I'm just beginning to start to talk about it because in the past, what would happen was that I would write about my journey or about my, my muddlings of spirituality and the criticism and the vitriol that I received from people is so intense that I determined by the time I was about 22 years old that I would never write any more about G-O-D. Or, or, or I didn't want to have anything to do with Christian festivals. I, was, I refused to play anything Christian, even though that's where I came from. Um, because the hate mail was so intense. Yeah. I had an email, uh, I had a, a letter sent to my house from someone who said, if you had written a song about your mother, I wrote a song called Mother on this last record that was um, a metaphor. And she took it so literally, like metaphor just was completely non-existent in her understanding of art or poetry. And and I just thought, I don't need this. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. This is not what, I, what conversation I'm interested in having. And so, but at the same time, I have to reckon with where I come from and naming my lineage and naming the difficulty and the complexity of it has really gripped me right now. And I think embracing the fact that it is complicated and people are going to get up in arms about ideas or beliefs. Sure. And that is where we are in society. But it also is a vacuum of our time because where so many people had church in their cultural experience, that is no longer true. And so the yoga class doesn't fill that that void that church used to fill. And I think what I see happening in so many ways is this spiritual vacuum where people are trying to find something. And so then, you know, you get these wild internet quilts yeah. <laughs> of people hodgepodging all of these beliefs together. But it's not like yeah. based in communal expression. There's the I, I found that with some of the beliefs that developed because they developed in isolation, there hasn't been the social, the social contact or accused. Like 
like I, I don't know. It's it, it, not to be so crass, but a few years ago, you say some of this 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 crazy ass shit. You'd be in the context of the people saying, like, look, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I think people are just not getting the other, hey, are you okay? type of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not there to buffer each like, other or to have have a beautifully dissenting view. <laughs> but there, thank you. That's what it is right there. A beautifully it's, dissenting view, engaged, interested in a conversation rather than uh, a bullet or a punch, right? So yes. it's, it's, conversation. it's so important to have dialogue. You don't yes. need to believe the same thing I believe. I don't want you to. I'm, I don't I want to know what what in the world do you think? Absolutely, we share we 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 share that. Um, and uh, uh, I like the engagement. You know, I'm for me in, in doing the show and stuff like that. I mean, I'm trained for engagement in a certain sense. I mean, there's there's this kind of I, I want to say oppositional, but like I work as a union rep. I'm trained as a philosopher. If making people comfortable was my main goal, I've made a lot of wrong <laughs> choices. So, you know, I like knowing where people are, what they're thinking and how they stand uh, on, you know, on their position. Um, hey, Shara, I want to um, before before we let you uh, go, because I. I have to, um, we have to let you go. Um, how do people, where do you want people to, to, to find you and find your art? You get a lot of different things that you do and, uh, you evolve and, um, how to, where, where do you want people to look to, to get some more Sharon Nova, uh, some more brightest diamond or whatever you see fit. Thank you. I have a couple of different branches to my life. One is the singer and the composer, and that part of the world lives on Shara, S-H-A-R-A dash Nova, N-O-V-A dot com. So all the things are over there. And then for my pop music, mybrightestdiamond.com is the place for the pop stuff. Of course, Instagram, I'm there as well, but on Instagram, everything is under my brightest diamond. Twitter, are we using Twitter anymore? I, uh, I I've never uh, had any success or encouragement <laughs> or aptitude or understand. And I, I've tried, and there's no, re- there's no reason to try anymore. I don't know, just me right now. And then I am writing and sharing more of my process and thoughts on Substack. Substack, that's uh, that's it's a good place to go. Writing, extended thought, and engagement. That sounds uh, that sounds really cool. But definitely check out uh, Shara's music if if you haven't. I've I've enjoyed it f- uh, for quite some time. And as I told you, Shara, uh, like in this being of mine, the neurons firing in my head. I've wanted to have you on the show uh, for for quite some time, and uh, been doing it for three years. It is a deep pleasure to engage with your art uh, and your mind. And um, just want to thank you for coming on to the something rather than nothing podcast. Thank you so much, Ken. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, look forward to 2023 because we haven't got into it, but I know how you're thinking about things and your creativity. Uh, is going to be a big year, Shara, uh, art and otherwise. So uh, it, it's it's great to meet you and chat with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. I have never loved someone the way I love you. I have never seen a smile like yours. And if you grow up to be king or clown or pauper, I will say you are my favorite one in town. I have never held a hand so soft and sacred when I hear your laugh. I know heaven's key And when I grow to be a puppy in the graveyard I will send you all my love upon the breeze And if the breeze won't blow
This is Something Rather Than Nothing.